Hello, welcome to the second part of lecture 7 of Tripoli 20. Lecture 7 is about steady magnetic fields. So let's pick up where we left off. I introduced to you uh, the magnetic field and where it came from. Mostly we're just considering uh, how it came from currents or moving charges. Right? And uh, the last topic that we discussed in the first part is the curl operation. So the curl is actually a measure of uh, how much spin is uh, how much spin is your vector field how much spin is the vector field how much is the spin of the vector field rather in <clears throat> a certain point okay, so how much does it spin in a certain point so it's something like uh, having a very small uh, paddle wheel on a uh, river Right, and you measure how much the paddle wheel spins and you're already measuring the curl of the water current on that point right. so uh, the curl actually is a complicated expression because it's actually a cross product from your del and uh, in different coordinate systems it looks like this okay so uh, for the Cartesian, it's easy, since you'll just gonna, you're just gonna use your uh, cross product operation. In cylindrical, it's uh, it's not it's not really that. Uh, what do you call this? It's uh, not really that uh, intuitive, rather, and also spherical, as you can see here. So for uh, to summarize, basically. Uh, our magnetic field has uh, Dio Savart's law and uh, the analogy from the electric field is Coulomb's law for the uh, magnetic field we have Ampere's circuital law for the electric field we have Gauss law for the magnetic field we have the curl operation to, to define its point form for the electric field, we have the divergence operator to define the magnetic uh, electric flux density. Okay. So, uh, but in electric field, recall that we have the divergence theorem. Basically, to relate the uh, to relate the magnetic flux density to itself in a different form, or to magnetic field. Oh, uh, sorry, the uh, Electric, uh, electric flux density to its divergence. We also have something on our magnetic field that relates the magnetic field to its curl. That is the Stokes theorem. So uh, recall that for a current passing through a uh, defined area, the total current is equal to the surface integral of J and dS. Okay. So this area actually, so we have a current passing through an area, specified area. This area is defined by a closed loop. Okay. The area is defined by a closed loop. So if it's defined by a closed loop, there must be there must be a uh, <clears throat> sorry there must be a magnetic field flowing around that loop since it's uh, since a current is passing through it okay. so again a surface is defined by the loop defined by a uh, loop loop path okay and uh, do note that the direction of the area is actually perpendicular to the uh, to the loop or if you use your thumb to point to the direction of the area or the direction of the current and you curl your right hand you'll see that your right hand curls in this direction So, as we know from Ampere's law, 
we get the closed loop integral of h dotted to or to, dotted to a closed path which is defined by this loop and that is now equal to the total current and close which is this but this is defined as the surface integral of your current density All right so since the current density is equal to the cross the curl of h or del cross h we can rewrite this as this All right so ignore the circle right here this is just a normal surface integral, not a closed surface integral. Okay? A normal surface integral, not a closed surface integral. Okay. So this is, this whole expression here is the Stokes theorem. The evaluation, so uh, the evaluation of the line integral should follow the direction according to the right-hand rule. That's what I showed you earlier. You define an area. This area has a vector that is uh, parallel to the current. Okay. The area has a vector that is parallel to the current. So this area. And you use your right hand, right, right thumb to point to that direction. Curl your hand. Okay. Curl your hand. The direction of the curl of your hand, right hand, okay, will be the direction of the loop. And that is the closed loop path that you will follow. So this theorem now relates a closed line integral or closed loop integral to a surface integral. Recall that for our divergence theorem is that we're relating a closed surface integral with a volume integral. Right. So what's next? Actually, there's not. There's no more. There's just two of them. <laughs> okay. So anyway, an example. So given the field that, whatever this is, evaluate the both sides of Stokes' theorem. For the cone, right, portion of the cone, uh, theta is equal to 0 0.1 pi, bounded by the rate r is equal to 2, 2 r is equal to 4, and phi is from 0 to 0 0.3 pi. Let the direction of ds be a theta. Well, it's not let, it's actually a theta. Yes, so this area is actually just a theta. Since the perpendicular component of that area is defined by a theta. Okay, so Stokes theorem is this. First, let's evaluate the left-hand side of Stokes theorem, which is your uh, closed-loop integral. So, the path is divided into four parts, your uh, A to B, B to C, C to D, and D to A. So, there are four integrals in this path. First path is A to B. So, let's examine that. Let me just uh, clean this slide first. So, A to B is a path along a circle. A to B is the path along a circle defined by your phi direction. Therefore, this path is actually a, uh, basically an arc length. Arc length rho times delta phi. In terms of differential length, it's rho d phi. Rho is the radius of the circle. What is the radius of the circle? That is equal to the, uh, the radius from the origin times sine theta since theta is defined as the angle from the z-axis so this is r sine theta d phi and it's only the phi component since we're getting the dot product we're only getting the phi component of your magnetic field which is this second term so that's what happened here so you multiply that to r sine theta and evaluate that at the current position from a so the current position at A is that theta is 0.1 pi and R is equal to 2. So it's the same theta all throughout, but R is equal to 2 at this point. Right? So that is the first integral. From B to C, so we start from here and end up at C. This path is actually basically a differential radius from the origin. 
So this path is defined by AR hat. So it's a differential radius. Therefore, the direction of this DL is AR hat. And we're only considering the, sec uh, the first term of your magnetic field. And we get this expression. Evaluate it at phi equals 0 0.35. Because at this point, from B to C, phi is constant from zero uh, phi is constant at 0 0.3 pi so that's this path for c to d it's from here to here again you're moving in a arc oh, but the uh, but the radius of that arc length is now larger than the the from a to b so it's still r sine theta but we evaluate it at r is equal to 4. So the current position from C to D, we have a constant radius which is r is equal to 4. And uh, that is this expression. Theta is still 0.1, but r is now 4. And you integrate it from phi equals 0 0.3 pi to 0. Because the path defined is from 0 0.3 pi to 0. Okay? So from D to A, it's the same as D to C, but this time you're moving from 4 to 2. And phi is 0 at that point. So you're moving from D to A, from D to A, there you go. You're moving from D to A, your, your, uh, your phi is constant, but your R changes from 4 to 2. So get the first part first uh, term of your magnetic field intensity and you'll get this expression and evaluate it at phi is equal to zero okay. so basically just do the uh, do the integration from this to this get this ex this expression this expression okay. so, uh, just substitute use your calculator and you can see that the total current Enclosed by the path is 12.44 amperes. Now let's evaluate the right side of Stokes' theorem. The right side is uh, the surface integral of del cross H. So we know that the current density is del cross H. Since it's in spherical coordinates, we get... Uh, since it's in spherical coordinates... We use the definition of the curl in spherical coordinates, right here, 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 and here, a rho, a theta, and a phi. But uh, the surface, the differential surface, there should be a dot product here. So del cross h dotted to ds. The differential surface has uh, only uh, is only pointed in one direction. So remember that. So let me just clean this again. Uh, this differential area actually points to a theta hat always. Okay? It always points to a theta hat because okay? it's part of a cone defined by a constant theta. Therefore, we're only going to get this term of your curl, which becomes this. Okay, So evaluate that. So you evaluate that, you get this expression, okay, substitute and simplify. Finally, you'll be left with this expression right here. So this is the theta component of the current density. So since theta is constant all throughout, just substitute theta, so 0.1 pi right here. And simplifying further, you'll get this expression for j theta. And now we want to get the surface integral of that. And the surface is the bounded by phi is from 0 to 0 0.3 pi and r is from 2 to 4. This integral. Finally, let's just, uh, since the bounds are constant, can separate the integrals into into themselves. This uh, cosine phi 
will just be sine phi. This r becomes r squared over 2. Okay. And then, evaluate the integrals from this to this and this to this. You get this expression, sorry, this, this number, which is the, um, again, the enclosed current in that defined path. That, uh, as you can see, uh, we have shown that for this example, the left side and the right side of Stokes' theorem are equal when you evaluate them. So, similar to our divergence theorem, we use this for a sanity check. So we use this for sanity check to see if our calculations are correct in one side of the equation. Alright. So that is Stokes' theorem. So let's re let's have a recap. We have Biot-Savart, Biot-Savart law, Ampere circuital law, the curl, and then Stokes' theorem. So something may be missing. What is it? So for electric field intensity, it has a electric flux density. Well, current, oh, sorry, where magnetic field actually also has a magnetic flux. So, um, I believe in physics books, this is of more, uh, this is discussed more than the magnetic field intensity. The magnetic flux is defined as the amount of magnetic field passing through a surface. So, it has the same definition as the electric flux. The electric flux is psi is equal to the surface integral of your uh, electric flux density dotted to, dotted to a surface. So, this D and this B, so D and B, these are flux vector fields so they are flux densities and we have E and H are field intensities okay, so that's their twins if you can think of if you want to uh, have an analogy about it so uh, magnetic flux is measured in Weber's and the magnetic flux density is in Tesla not Tesla it's Tesla so it's it's a tribute to uh, Nikola Tesla. Is it Nikola? Anyway, so it's a tribute to Tesla, one of the greatest inventors of all time, I believe. Okay. Some would argue. Anyway, so uh, the magnetic flux density is related to the field intensity by this equation right here. So recall for our electric field, we have something like this. Oops, sorry. There you go. So, um, let's just consider first free space. What is mu sub zero? Mu sub zero is called the permeability of free space. Epsilon sub zero is the permittivity of free space. So, um, let's consider first uh, free space so we um, there won't be any complications okay? and later we'll be discussing what would happen if we put a magnetic field within a material okay all right so this is your magnetic flux and the total magnetic flux is just the integral of your flux density dotted to a differential surface so we won't be uh, discussing that much the closed surface integral of a flux, mainly because the closed surface integral of a magnetic flux is zero due to the non-existence of magnetic charge, quote unquote. There are no magnetic monopoles in nature. Mainly because if you find a magnet, a magnetic north and magnetic south is always present even if you break that that magnet so let me visualize that so you have a magnetic bar so best representation it has north and south if you cut that in this area in this direction so that's when we have a separate north and south 
you can see that at this region where you cut it, this becomes a new south, this becomes a new north. Okay? So you'll have two permanent magnets, but that, that is still not magnetic monopoles or do not have a net magnetic charge. Therefore, you can always think of mag uh, magnetic fields as always spinning around and always connected. Okay. If there is a magnetic field somewhere, right, uh, traveling in this direction, it will always have a return path. That means you cannot enclose a magnetic field so if you try to enclose it in a surface, okay, so you won't enclose anything because what enters will always exit. So if you evaluate the closed surface integral of your uh, magnetic flux density, it will always be zero due to the non-existence of quote-unquote magnetic charges or magnetic monopoles. So, the highlight there is there are no magnetic monopoles in nature. So, well, at least there hasn't been any discovery of it yet. Maybe in a weird world, in a galaxy far, far away, maybe magnetic monopoles do exist. You know, the, the universe is large. And uh, we only know a very small fraction of it. Okay. Maybe. Magnetic monopoles do exist. Maybe in another universe, magnetic monopoles exist, but electric monopoles do not exist. And the laws of physics are flipped. Anyway, I'm just rambling here. So let's go back to the topic. If the closed loop integral of B dot Vs is zero, then if we uh, you get the uh, if we use the divergence theorem, you'll see that the divergence of our magnetic flux is actually zero. As compared to the divergence of our electric flux, it's equal to the charge enclosed by the closed surface or the volume charge density. Okay. So that is the side-by-side uh, -side comparison of your magnetic flux and electric flux. So for example, let's have a filamentary current, a filamentary current that is going to the negative x direction. So uh, it's illustrated there. So uh, we want to know the total flux passing through this surface. So bounded by x is from 1 to 3. Sorry, x is from 1 to 3, from here to here. And y is from 1 to 4, from here to here. Oh wait, look, that's flipped, sorry. From x is equal to 1 to x is equal to 3, that's from here to here. And from y is equal to 1 to y is equal to 4, that is from here to here. Okay? Alright. So, uh, you know, we know, actually, that the magnetic field intensity is equal to I over 2 pi rho times AP hat. So, the magnetic flux of a current along the x-axis okay, and going to the negative x-direction on the xy-plane so we're only considering the magnetic field that is immediately at the xy-plane okay, and that is going to the negative az-direction okay, so it's going here so the magnetic flux is equal to mu sub 0 times h or mu not h substitute that knowing the direction get this expression right here. The rho becomes equal to y since this uh, measurement from here to here, this is rho, that is just defined by the direction of y. So you get this expression for your magnetic flux density. The next step is to define the differential surface. Since we're only uh, concerned with y, the uh, x component of your ds will only be x is equal to 3 minus x is equal to 1, which is 2. That's why we have this expression for ds. And we set the direction of ds to be uh, with the direction of our uh, magnetic field at that point. 
which is negative AZ hat. Therefore, DS is equal to negative 2 DY AZ hat. So, knowing that, you get the dot product, okay, B dot DS, integrate that from Y equals 1 to 4, and uh, we get this expression for it. So, negative times negative becomes positive, AZ dotted to AZ is 1, and we're just concerned with scalar integration at this point. Okay. And then, uh, just uh, integrate that. Okay. We have 10 amperes times mu sub 0. So, cancel, the 2 will cancel. And then, integrate it with respect to y. It will be ln y. Evaluate that from 1 to 4. Use your calculator from here on. You get 5.55 micro Weber's. And that is the concept of the magnetic flux. So, again, to recap, Biosavar. That's uh, the first part for your magnetic field. Ampere circuital law, and then Stokes theorem. Sorry, the curl operator, and then Stokes theorem. And then we have the concept of magnetic flux. Uh, there's there seems to be another quantity that is missing. It's actually the magnetic potential. So if the electric field has an electric potential or the voltage V can also have or can also define a magnetic potential for H. So first let's look at the point form or the relationship of the electric field to the magnetic potential. We know that the electric field is equal to the negative gradient of the magnetic potential. There's also a scalar function that measures the magnetic potential and it's also defined this way. So let's define it that way. And we let it be Vm. So Vm is the magnetic potential. Therefore, the relationship between H and Vm is the negative gradient of your scalar potential Vm. That's equal to your uh, magnetic field intensity H. Okay? So we just need to restrict this term first. So we know that the del or the curl of H is equal to the current density J okay. but if we get the gradient the curl of the gradient of any scalar field it's always zero okay. so any scalar field if we take the gradient of that so if we take the gradient of that we'll end up with a vector field that is essentially perpendicular to your, uh, to, your, to your scalar field. So if you take the curl of that, it will be zero. Okay? So the curl of any uh, poten uh, potential field is zero. Therefore, this del cross H so it should be zero. So, to satisfy that condition, to get a scalar magnetic potential. So, to get a scalar magnetic potential at that region, the current density should be zero. So, it's only valid if the current density is zero in the region of your magnetic potential. Okay. So, that's a restriction. Therefore, if there's a current density there, you can define a magnetic potential. Okay, so uh, scalar magnetic field, example, your coaxial cable. So in this region, there's a current, this region has a current, therefore, we're only considering the region between them. Okay, so Vm can be defined between these two regions. So we know that magnetic field intensity is this expression, which is equal to negative gradient of your scalar magnetic, magnetic potential. So knowing that, it's only in the AV direction, we're just going to get the AV component of this gradient, which is this expression right here. Now we can solve for Vm by uh, cross-multiplying rho and simplifying the partial derivative of Vm with respect to phi becomes this. And finally, if we integrate that, it becomes this expression right here. V sub m 
is equal to negative i over 2 pi times v plus the constant of integration. So we set this constant of integration 0. Okay. And because we know Vm is arbitrarily increasing, uh, decreasing with respect to phi. So this constant of integration is 0 and uh, Vm is equal to phi. So it just linearly decreases with respect to phi. So if you move from phi equals 0 okay, to back again, but this time it's 2 pi, the magnetic potential at this point becomes negative i. What happened? Okay, we just move until from here to here but not touching. Okay? So we're at phi is equal to 2 pi. The vector magnetic potential is equal to negative i. What happened here? Because if we get the closed loop integral of h dot dl, closed loop integral of h dot dl, which is equal to your vector magnetic potential, that is equal to the current enclosed. Right? So we did not have this condition when we had our electric field. Because the closed loop integral of an electric field for the electrostatic case is actually equal to zero. This, uh, since our uh, closed loop integral of electric field is zero, our uh, scalar potential, our voltage, is only single value. But for our magnetic field, since the closed loop integral is i, the vector magnetic potential at this point, which is theta is equal to zero, two pi, four pi, six pi, eight pi, they're all the same. It's the same point. The vector magnetic potential, sorry, the scalar magnetic potential is different. Okay. It depends on how many times have you circled this loop. And that is because of this expression of our magnetic field. Since the, mag the closed loop integral of the magnetic field is non-zero, it makes this magnetic field non-conservative, making the, vec the scalar magnetic potential or scalar magnetic field have multiple values. Okay? So, uh, what how do we get the potential at this, at some arbitrary point then? Some arbitrary point P at maybe phi is equal to pi over 4. How do we get the vector magnet, uh, the scalar magnetic potential V sub M at this point? Okay. So let's agree then to put a barrier here at uh, phi is equal to pi and we only uh, restrict the region of Vm from negative pi to pi and they're not touching each other. Therefore, your uh, expression for the magnetic field potential or scalar magnetic potential will be a single value. Right? So if you restrict the region, all right? So this is your the, the major difference between your magnetic potential and your electric potential. Okay. So um, actually, this is not enough to be an analogy with our vector, sorry, with our uh, electric field potential or electric potential. A better definition for a magnetic potential would be since uh, we're going to use the property that is zero. What am I saying here? If we use the vector poten the electric field potential, I keep saying vector, right? Anyway, if we use the electric field potential, we use the condition that E dot DL 
is equal to zero. For a magnetic field, what quantity, if you uh, put it in a closed region, becomes zero? That's actually your electric flux. If we enclose the electric flux by a closed surface, it actually becomes zero. And from there, we can actually define a magnetic potential. So it's uh, very different from uh, the scalar magnetic potential, as, you can, as I've, I've shown you here. It, it's actually a vector magnetic potential. Okay. So we're going to use the closed surface integral of V dot ds to define a vector magnetic potential. Okay. So we're going to leverage on the fact that the divergence of a curl of any vector is zero. Okay. So we're just going to use that and we can define a magnetic potential. So uh, this is the divergence of B. And if we let B, uh, the current, sorry, the flux density, magnetic flux density, to be the curl of a vector A, we're not violating any laws on magnetic fields. Since the divergence of any curl of a vector field is zero. So we let a be the vector magnetic potential. So B is equal to the curl of A. And it since A should can any can be any vector field, we can actually uh, we can actually uh, what do you call this? So any yeah. So we can actually um, satisfy this condition del dot B equals zero since the divergence of the curl of any vector field is zero. Okay. It follows that our uh, magnetic field becomes this, 1 over mu, del cross A. So A is your vector magnetic potential. And by having this definition, by having this definition, the expression for A becomes this u naught i dl over 4 pi r. Okay? Similar to the expression for the voltage. For any, for in this case, it's a filamentary current. For our voltage, maybe a charge. A point charge distribution. Oh, sorry, there you go. Let me just delete that. Okay. So you can see that this expression for the voltage or the electric potential is actually similar to this uh, expression for our vector magnetic potential. So a differential. Sorry, not 4 pi r squared, it's just r. For a differential uh, differential current, IDL, it results into a potential of mu naught IDL divided by 4 pi r. For a differential charge in a distribution, the, vo the potential due to that charge is dq over 4 pi epsilon times r. So you can see how similar these two are. So it makes sense that the better analogy for a vec for a uh, magnetic potential is actually the vector magnetic potential instead of our scalar potential. But both of these have their uh, both of these have their own uses. Okay. This scalar magnetic field is useful for analyzing what we call magnetic circuits. So if you have an electric circuit, you also have a magnetic circuit. And this vector magnetic potential is actually a better analogy for our uh, our uh, electric potential due to the fact that it results into the same expression as your 
skill or potential. Albeit, but it's a vector. So, albeit a vector. Okay. Also, this is useful in analyzing the radiation from different sources. When you're analyzing an antenna, you can use vector magnetic potential. When you're analyzing the radiation from a microwave, you can use vector magnetic potential. But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so let's stop there. This is the end of the second part. If you have any questions, just leave a comment in the comment section below. So, uh, uh, thank you again for listening. So, uh, maybe uh, I've always been ending the lectures awkwardly. I'll close it properly now. So, uh, again, let me reiterate. Leave a comment if you have any questions, comments. If you want, if you want to comment on uh, how to how to improve my uh, video lectures, just comment away. I'll take the comments seriously. Okay. So thank you for listening. I'll see you when I see you.